Hey everyone, in the last couple of episodes, we've been working with observables and their representations as linear operators within our vector space. In this episode, I want to introduce Hermitian operators and show you how they connect to our physical observables. As a heads up, make sure you've watched chapter 7 on observables, since we will be using results derived in that chapter. To begin, I want to introduce some slightly new notation. We have worked with the following expression a lot. This is just acting the operator m on the ket phi. Because m acting on phi returns another vector, we also commonly write this as follows. This is just a ket representing the vector we would get when we act m on phi. So when we have an inner product expression that looks like this, it's sometimes more convenient to write it like this. Remember that this is just the inner product with psi and m phi. So with that, here's the setup and geometric intuition. Say we have this inner product. Remember that the inner product is basically the dot product, so let's rely on that for some intuition. Remember that we have the following equivalent expression for the dot product. So, geometrically, this inner product basically says act m on phi, and then measure the new angle between the new vector and psi, scaled by their lengths. Now, here's what we want to investigate. Do we have an operator n that we can apply to psi instead, and give an equal inner product? Geometrically, we're asking if we have an operator that allows us to instead move psi, and still give us the same magnitude times angle of the two vectors. And this must be true for any two vectors, phi and psi, that we choose. It turns out there is such an operator. This operator is called the Hermitian adjoint. We designate the Hermitian adjoint by taking our operator and adding a dagger in front of it. The fundamental property of the Hermitian adjoint is that it satisfies the following property for any vector phi and psi. Now, there are a few properties of the Hermitian adjoint that I want to show you, but their proof is not very enlightening. However, I encourage you to practice bracket notation and try proving them yourself. They're fairly easy proofs. First. The Hermitian adjoint of the Hermitian adjoint is the operator itself. Second, the Hermitian adjoint of a sum is the sum of the Hermitian adjoints. Lastly, and often most importantly, the Hermitian adjoint of a product of operators is calculated by switching their order and then taking the individual Hermitian adjoints. If you're going to prove any one of these, this last one is the one to try. Before moving on to the connection to quantum mechanics, I want to discuss some common Hermitian adjoints that you'll encounter. First, say we have a scalar number. What is the Hermitian adjoint of this? Well, we can set up an inner product with the scalar number as the operator. We want to know how to move this scalar to the other side of the inner product. Well, we can pull the scalar out of the right-hand side of the inner product since the right side is linear. Then, we can remember that the left side of the inner product is antilinear, so we have to complex conjugate the scalar to move it to the left side. Therefore, we have that the Hermitian adjoint of a scalar is just the complex conjugate. This is an important fact that you should remember. Second, what is the Hermitian adjoint of a ket? Now, this might seem like a weird question, since we've been considering a ket as a vector, not an operator, but bear with me as we try to make sense of it. Instead of working with the ket by itself, let's work with it within an inner product. So what is the Hermitian adjoint of an inner product? Well, an inner product is just a number, so we get the complex conjugate, which just flips the inner product. But we can also evaluate the Hermitian adjoint of the inner product by first breaking up our inner product and using our rule for adjoint products. We switch the positions and then take the individual Hermitian adjoints. This expression and the one we previously found must both be equal. Since phi and psi are both completely arbitrary, this seems to point to the fact that the Hermitian adjoint of a ket is a bra and the Hermitian adjoint of a bra is a ket. Now, this is more of a justification than a rigorous proof, but this really is true. 
In the description, I've linked a Stack Exchange post that goes more in depth into how we can consider a ket as an operator to prove this. So, how do these Hermitian adjoints connect with quantum physics? Well, we can ask ourselves, what is the Hermitian adjoint of an observable? To answer this, let's go over what we know about observables so far. Remember that we found that physical observables are represented by linear operators whose eigenvectors represent definite states, and eigenvalues represent the corresponding measured value. Observables must also follow certain rules from our physical intuition. Let's recap the rules we first derived in Chapter 7. First, the eigenvalues must be real, since measured quantities are obviously real. Second, the eigenvectors must span the whole space, since each quantum state must carry some value for the observable. Last, the eigenvectors must be orthogonal, otherwise they wouldn't be definite states. These last two allow us to conclude that observables have an orthonormal eigenbasis. Given these properties of observables, I want to show you an incredibly useful way to express observables that will be helpful in finding the adjoint. First, let's consider our observable acting on an arbitrary quantum state. Since this operator has an orthonormal eigenbasis, we can expand our quantum state in this eigenbasis. Then we can move the operator into the sum. Since these are eigenvectors, the operator will just give us the corresponding eigenvalue. Now, what about the coefficient ci? Remember that we previously derived the following expression for the coefficients. And if you don't remember, it's really easy to verify. So, we can substitute this in. Then, we can move the inner product over to the right. Now, using the power of bracket notation, we can break up this inner product. Since psi is the same for every term of the sum, we can pull it out. So we found that the action of the observable on any psi is the same as the action of this sum of operators. In other words, they are equal. So we found that observables can be written as a sum involving their eigenstates and real eigenvalues. If we have an observable with a continuous eigenbasis, we can follow the same logic to derive the following analogous expression. So why is this useful? Well, let's use this form for observables to see what the Hermitian adjoints are. We'll do the discrete case here, but note that the logic is the same in the continuous case. First, let's use the property that the Hermitian adjoint of a sum is the sum of the Hermitian adjoints. Next, let's use our product rule for the Hermitian adjoint. We flip the order and then distribute the dagger. The Hermitian adjoint of a bra is a ket, the adjoint of a ket is a bra, and the adjoint of a scalar is the complex conjugate. Remember that the eigenvalues have to be real, since these represent the outcome values that we can measure. So, this just gives us the same eigenvalue, and we can move it back to the left since it's a scalar. And check it out, we get the exact same operator back. So, we've just proven that the Hermitian adjoint of a physical observable is itself. We have a special name for operators that are their own Hermitian adjoints. We call them Hermitian operators, which I agree is sort of a confusing name, but it's what we call them. So, we have found that all observables are Hermitian operators, and therefore, they satisfy the following inner product property. Since we deal with observables all the time in quantum mechanics, this property is really handy, so it's worth remembering. I want to take a step back and review how we got to this conclusion. In almost all quantum mechanics textbooks, observables are simply declared to be Hermitian. From this declaration, they usually then use some statement of the spectral theorem to conclude that Hermitian operators have an orthonormal eigenbasis with real eigenvalues. This usually ends with some statement like, these properties conveniently model physical observables. What I wanted to show you is that you can instead use physical intuition to come to the conclusion that observables must be Hermitian operators. We did this by first finding that observables should be represented by linear operators. Then, we derived that if they were to model real physical quantities, they need to satisfy three properties. Finally, we found that this leads to the fact that observables must be Hermitian operators. 
I find this approach much more satisfying, since we use our physical intuition to develop the math, rather than the other way around. Although the spectral theorem is incredibly important, I thought it would be useful to show you how the universe's intuition drops the hermeticity of observables in our lap. So, hopefully you see that there's a good amount of intuition behind why observables are hermitian in quantum mechanics. Now that we know this fact, we can finally start digging into some of the neat properties that observables have. Starting with the next episode, we'll go over the ubiquitous commutator and how it relates to the infamous uncertainty principle, which hopefully won't be so mysterious after we've attacked it. With that, thank you so much for watching. As always, let me know if you have any questions. Hope to see you in the rest of the series.